All right, welcome everyone. Um, in the past few days, we looked at the design thinking process, um, and we also looked at some of the tools that we can use uh, for different stages and uh, the benefits of some of those, the mindsets, etc. Today, we would look at uh, design sprints, uh, which I would say is a is a smaller version uh, which could be applied uh, for design thinking or human centered design. We would also look at the aspects of the testing, which involves uh, usability um, and and of course uh, some bit of uh, some bit of uh, jams that we as design team can run, primarily for workshops and um, keep things structured so that we can get the output that we originally planned for uh, for some of those uh, workshops. Uh, so how do we create a formal way of running a workshop, et cetera, et cetera, is something that we also look at towards the end. So let's jump in into Design Sprint. Uh, as most of you know, uh, Design Sprint is something that uh, Google Ventures uh, came up with. Um, they were the ones who designed uh, what we call today as Design Sprint. It has gone through multiple rounds of iterations by different individuals. Uh, we also looked at one of those versions and applied what works for us as an industry, as an organization. And that's the one that we have been using. Now, Google uh, Ventures is, uh, is a wing of Google, uh, as you might know. Uh, that invests in startups and companies uh, who need help. They don't just invest in money and time and people, but they also invest in processes and tools that these organizations or companies can implement. And design thinking was one of those pieces where they could create meaningful products using a framework. And that was then uh, later on termed as uh, design sprints. So Design Sprint essentially is, is a combination of various things. It's a combination of things that we have been using in parts, um, like team brainstorming or ideation sessions or workshops, hackathons, lightning sessions, et cetera, et cetera. All of that combined together with all the different phases that we had looked at uh, in, uh, in, our, um, in our last four days. Uh, could be summarized as a very fast paced way of uh, implementation of uh, design thinking. So essentially a design sprint is all about running fast. Um, like we had discussed, um, I think on day one, that it is very, very important to understand where you are at in the process and what you want to achieve. Uh, the best ideas come under pressure and uh, within a time frame that you had decided for each of these steps. And that's what design thinking is all about. It just gives you a framework. Uh, and using that, you can uh, really design what you uh, originally wanted to as a best solution. Essentially, it allows you to very quickly look at the future of what the product might look like. Uh, it gives you a tangible output, and it is all about looking, uh, having a sneak peek of what the eventual uh, solution or the product or the feature might look like. Now, this with this whole time box thing, it really involves all of these steps that we had talked about, but essentially allows you to really, as a team, come together and look at the benefits of implementing some of those pieces, like co-creation and collaboration and using multidisciplinary team, et cetera, et cetera, using subject matter experts in the, in the team, et cetera. Uh, so the, the best part of this is within the four days, originally, Google, uh, Google Ventures decided that they would want to create a five-day sprint. Uh, but with lots of uh, different alterations and versions that came out in the market and the tools that were involved in that, we also use something which is a four day sprint and we would look at what that is. So it really allows you to create something tangible by the end of third day and test it out with some potential users on the fourth day and fifth days where you can actually look at what you had 
where you started from and where you ended and what you have created, right? Uh, and a very, very fast paced environment. Now, with lots of these uh, different uh, uh, methodologies that you might have seen, uh, there is Lean, there is Agile, Design Sprint, of course, is what we're talking about today. Uh, Lean essentially is all about uh, coming up with an idea, building it, launching it, and then learning from it, which is what startups do, right? They don't really go out in the market to test their idea first and then build it. The idea for a lean startup would be to quickly build something, put it out in the market, and test it out. That's what lean talks about. Agile is all about coming up with an idea and building. Uh, there is no room for uh, learning. There is no room for launching. Launching is, again, uh, uh, another wing of agile uh, where you you tag things as uh, releases and basically then launch it. But if you look at it from a product perspective, it is all about um, trying to uh, be agile as much as possible, as the as the term says, um, coming up with ideas while you're working on them, building it, and uh, and then adding as much as you can. In a typical agile environment, you don't really know much about what you're trying to build, and that's that's where agile comes in handy because as you are building you add more requirements and you keep on planning for the sprints as well as pis um, uh, product increments as we call it but that's agile design thinking is all about idea and learning from it right we're not really getting into the um, the the complexities of trying to have a uh, a development team building it and then launching it. Essentially, it is all about an idea which needs to be validated, tested out in the market uh, uh, that you can learn from internally, externally, with potential users, and then make it as concrete as you can. Essentially, that's what Design Sprint is all about, which is which is what the motto of design thinking is as well, right? So what do you get on four days? You get you get to create tangible outputs, which are essentially prototypes. Uh, you get to test your solutions that you had designed as a team uh, in these four days. And you get a buy-in from the entire team because we're talking about collaboration and everyone coming together in those four days. Uh, but when do you want to do it? Uh, so it could be at the start of a project uh, where you don't know much about it. It could be at any roadblock where you've hit a hit a situation where you don't know how to, um, what solution would be needed, what exactly is the problem, uh, how do you uh, how do you design for something which is really, really complex. Uh, that's where you can use design thinking uh, or design sprints rather, but you could also do it almost any time whenever you're trying to solve a problem, right? As soon as you understand a problem or you have defined a design challenge, for the team, you can go ahead and run a sprint, and that would do the uh, wonderful output for you. Uh, but just trusting the process, doing nothing else. Now, who's needed in design sprint? Uh, you might have noticed that I have, from day one, I've been saying that it has to be a cross-functional team. Everyone who's part of the team is a designer. We act as uh, specialists who are either experience specialist or interface specialist. Uh, and mostly facilitators who would help people to come up with ideas. How do we implement it? What are the, going to be the details of interaction design and all of those pieces is something that we take care of. But what solution would be the best for solving that problem is should always be a team effort. And that's why the cross-functional team is needed. Now, it has to be a diverse team, like I said. Uh, with people coming in from different walks of life, different responsibilities in an organization, project managers, product owners, engineers, architects, leadership team. Uh, when I say leadership, it could be your customers or it could be the project sponsors internally or externally, uh, people like them, uh, and of course, QA and, 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 and so on and so forth, right? depending on the type of problem that you're trying to solve. Now, how do we run a sprint? And the process would be very, very similar to what we have seen so far. It would look different visually, but essentially, if you look at it in detail, it is exactly what we had talked about, right? 
So like I said, uh, it's a four day sprint. So let's look at each of these days individually. Uh, Monday, and it could be typically any day, but let's say Monday, because you'd want to start a sprint and close it off in, in that same week itself. The whole idea is to define the challenge, uh, is to come up with the definition of what the challenge is all about. So the whole problem statement thing that we started with, that's where definition of challenge comes in. Monday also helps us brainstorm and use the brainstorming techniques to come up with possible solutions. And that's where you end day one. Now, please understand, I have also added something called as clients involved in this, where whoever is your customer, internal, external, he needs to be part of this day one because you're talking about the definition of the challenge and you're also talking about the possible solutions and them being involved gives a lot of <clears throat> um, the sense of co-creation and autonomy within the team. Uh, and that's where having them is really, really critical. Day two is where you actually decide what solutions work best for you. Now you would see uh, that these are all activities which are either divergent or convergent things that could be done individually things can be that needs to be done with the team uh and uh and and of course de deciding with everyone involved so possible solutions which i said on day one is something that you or anyone who's part of the design sprint is responsible for coming up with ideas individually we saw some examples where people had uh, created a map, they had sketched something, they created some flow, sh uh, flow charts, etc. Like those are pieces which you work on individually, trying to make a visual output of what you have been thinking in your head. How do you solve that particular problem? Right. Day two, identify the best solution is the convergent thing where you come together, look at the possible solutions, get ideas from it and say these are the ones that we have never thought about or these are the ones that are going to work best and as a team uh, prioritize this which gives a definition again right what you're trying to solve and with that you set things in order which essentially is all about picking up the best pieces of all the solutions that people have come up with bringing them together and somewhere defining what the storyboard might look like and when I say storyboard, essentially, what are the different steps that would come in from start to finish of solving a task or a problem, right? Again, this is where you need decision making, and that's where client's in involvement is important. Now, you define what client is for you, but like I said, a client here could be your customer, could be your sponsor, could be the decision maker uh, within the team who would be able to decide um, uh, on behalf of everyone, right? Everyone has an individual vote, but he's the one who also has some bit of veto power in the end. Day three is all about prototyping, where you essentially use what you had, uh, uh, what you had picked up as set things in order in the end of day two. You eventually use that. The design people, like all of us here on the call, build a prototype and the shape and size of the prototype, like I said, uh, could be anything depending on the project, which people can touch and feel and um, and essentially you can use it for testing, right? So that's the prototype. Uh, it could be paper prototype, it could be um, XD thing, it could be Miro, it could be Sketch or Figma or whatever tools you, you feel like, right? I've also said that I have personally used PowerPoints and Word documents as well, and they have worked but it completely depends on how polished output you'd want to create and what's the idea behind running this sprint right depending on the audience you define what you how much time you'd want to invest and what would work best for the users that you're eventually going to test this with right day three is also used for planning the test now, planning a test means um, when we when we saw uh, on day four, planning a test means you're going to create a plan, you're going to build a hypothesis, you're going to write down questions or areas that you want to cover, you define what kind of test you want to run, with, whether it would be um, uh, a moderated testing, uh, unmoderated testing, depending on whatever works for the sprint, whatever works for the project, 
or the organization or the teams involved, you would plan for it upfront. And then day four is all about testing and using the feedback for the next steps and eventually a presentation, which is outside the design sprint process. But eventually, you'd want to present something and say that this was our output and this is what we have learned from the spread. Right? Let's look a little bit in detail what these days mean, uh, these days encompass. So essentially, day one, like I said, Monday has things which we call as fast forward and fail. Looking at the challenge, the team comes together and say, in a fast forward may, uh, way, and there have been uh, a lot of these uh, tools where people look at, and they've been, uh, in, in some teams, people uh, actually go ahead and write down a press release for a product that would eventually get launched, let's say, six months down the line or a year down the line, right? So if there is a release that goes out to the market, or if there's a product that gets launched, what that press release might look like, which essentially talks about all the benefits and the values that the feature or the product is going to uh, uh, is, is going to give right uh, so fast forward is all about writing down all the good parts about that thing uh, it also involves what works today it also involves what would you eventually want it to work like uh, essentially nothing but statements and bullets and uh, what can fail is also something important where you look at what are the things that would stop you from achieving these things which you have written down as fast forwards right so if you've written down that this would give me a uh, adoption rate of uh, adoption increase of 25 percent what would really stop you right so that's what you also write down which essentially allows you to start with where you want to be and what would you not do uh, and you you are cautious from day one, right? And you don't make those mistakes. Is something that you start thinking about from that uh, word go. The next thing is writing a map, which is essentially creating those steps in your head as possible possibilities of what that uh, what that solution might look like, right? Uh, in your head, right? Again, individual things. You don't really present it to anyone, but essentially you keep it to yourself. Now, you would actually verify these things as the day progresses. So the next thing is ask the expert, which essentially is bringing in some subject matter expert, somebody who has the idea in his head, somebody who has either defined this challenge for you, a project sponsor or, uh, or, a, or a leadership person within the team, or probably uh, a subject matter expert who has seen some of these examples uh, done out there uh, in the market, right? So he would talk about what he feels should be uh, uh, should be the, uh, the output of a particular uh, problem. He also is available for you to ask questions and validate what you had written down in the in the map. Uh, and you, you, you're actually not showing it to anyone, like I said. But essentially, based on that map, uh, which is a um, uh, mind map of sorts in your head, right, which you've noted down somewhere, the format could be anything. But essentially, you're trying to understand what are the uh, what are the different pieces uh, of that puzzle that you're trying to solve. Lightning talk is again all about what they have seen in the industry. They talk about it very quickly in like ten minutes. And, and and talk about how others have done it and what works best, what has worked best in the past, where people have succeeded trying to solve something similar or they have failed, all of those things. And then with that, we write down how might we statements, which you also saw, and I'm going to share my screen and show you what those how might we's are. Essentially, how might we's are, um, uh, are ideas that you've come up with and you would write down and say, these are potential ways of what I think could work when I'm trying to solve this particular problem, right? Now, please understand this started from the problem statement. This also involved the fast forward where you wrote down some of those things that would eventually benefit uh, or solve a particular problem. You also wrote down what would not work. You created a map in your, uh, which was in your head in some, in some shape or size in a paper. But when you listen to 
uh, or, or when you heard the expert, when you interacted with them, when you as a team, you saw others asking questions and uh, things that you never thought about, or you heard things about the industry trends in the lightning talks, that's where you also expand your ideas that you had written in the map and write down how might we. So this is a refined version of what where you started from, right? Now, this is still individual. Now you come as a team, you would share what your how might we's are. The team would look at it one by one with uh, from each participant. And, uh, uh, and they would also do uh, the affinity mapping and the voting, which essentially is saying, I like this particular how might we. Uh, this might be interesting to uh, to move forward with, right? And then based on the the ones that have been the winners, you also categorize them somewhere and say that these are potential pieces of uh, of solving a particular problem. So, for example, if you're trying to uh, build a product or build a system which is big enough, or even for the smaller problems you can define some of these categories or areas, right? These are the ones that you essentially use for your categorization, which is nothing more affinity mapping, right? Um, and, uh, and of course, you somewhere also define your success matrix. And I think there was a question uh, in some, uh, some of the initial uh, conversations, where would you define the success matrix and what does it mean, right? The problem statement is not the success matrix, where you would, Define it is is a step here where you define and say based on whatever we have heard as a team, our individual ideas, our uh, our ideas that we have come up with uh, individually, but also collaborated and voted what works best and which ones uh, and which in which categories. Then you define a success matrix and say that you'd want to achieve X Y Z out of this design sprint, and that's what the success matrix for the sprint would be, right? With that you again go on your own and create some sketches and there are there is there is another process called four step sketching uh, there is a eight grade sketch, sketching as well which is which is out there but essentially you would use a method for sketching and essentially a sketching is all about coming up with multiple ideas uh, or multiple sketches to solve the problem uh, or or solve uh, use the solution rather which was highly voted right now whenever you see a solution that we should do xyz right you also per perceive it in different ways and you can solve it in different ways right for example to um uh, to talk about a product and make it popular uh, people would say that we should use facebook ads and we should talk about this and we should have webinars and we should uh, have talks and we should attend conferences, blah, 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 all of those things, right? But for each of these, the starting point and the ending point would be different. You can define various ways of doing the Facebook thing. You can define the various ways of doing the uh, the LinkedIn or the workshop things or, or the talks and participating in conferences and just giving a half the example. But essentially, there are multiple ways which you can come up with, which is the different types of sketches that you uh, create, which ends day one, but day two is all about the art museum, which essentially means that once you're done with this, you put it out there in in some uh, on the walls of a room. If they, if you're doing it physically, if not, then you use a mirror board and add all your sketches that you had uh, created, and the team would come in individually. They would look at without you trying to explain and. Um, uh, and somewhere, um, uh, how should I say it? Somewhere trying to uh, sell your idea. Uh, you don't do that. Essentially, the team looks at it on their own, and then tries to, and then try to. They try to understand which one would work work best and what they like about that particular sketch, right? And the heat map is essentially again a level of voting, where they say these are the areas that we like. So heat map is all about circling things that would work best. And then um, some bit of speed critic, which essentially is interacting with the person who has built those ideas and and and, and talking about what what's 
best and trying to also be a critic in terms of what could potentially not work in that particular idea uh, or the solution uh, and essentially trying to create a storyboard which essentially means that all of these multiple pieces that people had sketched they come together in some sort of a linear timeline uh, which is what i was mentioning as put it in order uh, which could now have clear steps and we can say that we are trying to create this journey right which essentially is a storyboarding right people have used different methods of storyboarding we as in we as people in education we have different uh, notions of what a storyboard might look like but when you're working with interdisciplinary team essentially storyboarding means clear definition of steps here right it could be visual it could be post-it notes it could be just square boxes with some text written it could be anything right and the storyboard is essentially then used um, and uh, and please uh, please do understand this is a team activity right uh, the storyboard essentially is used to build a prototype because you'd want the sequence of things right that's your prototyping uh, which is done by typically the ux or the ui people you don't really need the larger team uh, the people who are going to test it also plan about the tests on day three and essentially day four is all about testing 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 taking stakeholder reviews writing down a conclusion and essentially trying to uh, create a, a presentation in the end to the larger team who was involved uh, and tell them how the users who used this particular solution reacted uh, to it right so that's again if you think about it whatever we have covered in the last four days this essentially this is essentially uh, putting things in action again in those four days. So uh, very fast pace, you would actually see that some of the templates that we use, we write down time for each of the steps. So if there is a two and a half hour workshop, if there is a two hour workshop that we had arranged or a Zoom meeting that we had blogged, we eventually uh, are giving 15 minutes for fast forwards and the team has to quickly think about what those best things could be when you are when i'm trying to solve that particular problem right and what would not work so they actually get 15 minutes to write it down 15 minutes gone and there is a buzzer and you have to move to the next step and accordingly every step has some time right it, it's not always 15 minutes but depending on what is uh what takes more time you allot those uh, times to each of these steps and that's where you you are able to squeeze in all the tools and some of the things that we saw in the last four days into these um, time boxed uh, activities essentially uh we've seen what how might how might we looks like but let's look at the success matrix now uh there's another tool called uh, heart model uh, which is what uh, we have used in and there are various models so you don't uh, you don't really have to use a model but heart is the one that i have personally used uh, in in some occasions which really talks about some of these key aspects of the design and a product uh, output essentially so whenever we are trying to create something, we'd want to measure the happiness. We'd want to measure the engagement level. We'd want to measure the adoption. We'd want to measure the retention. And we'd also want to measure the task success. Now, again, please understand success matrix was defined within the, uh, within the time frame of, uh, of the sprint, but it also expands out for the larger product and the launch, right? So the same matrix, uh or the same categories of the metrics could be used for the larger product when it gets launched to continuously track and see if it had worked the way we had expected it from because a lot of times we see results varying when you're doing a usability test within a sprint setup and when you're trying to put this in front of the real users the the results vary that's why uh, it's always recommended to mimic as, as much as possible with the real users, or if you have users who are acting as the real users, mimic them as much as possible with their environment and, and all of those AI you use that we saw the other day. But 
also understand that all of these metrics are not applicable every time. So you might not be able to have an adoption thing if you're if you're not really a B2C person, right? If you're not a B2C product, if you're not designing a solution uh, as an individual for uh, directly for the consumer, then adoption might not be something that you would be able to measure. Retention might also not be something that you'd be able to measure easily, right? But you can definitely measure the happiness. You can definitely manage. Uh, uh, measure the engagement as well as the task success and task success is something that gets applied anywhere and everywhere right because eventually you're trying to help people to to solve or 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 not solve but essentially help them with the day-to-day -day tasks and there is always a task that they'd want to accomplish okay um any questions so far before i move forward So, Kairo, um, usually what we've seen is that people come up with certain ideas, okay? You could call it a bias or it could be an idea or mm -hmm. solutions in their end, uh, heads, right? So, typically people uh, have an anxiety of coming up with solutions and that's what they do. Uh, when you start a sprint, you would typically want, you know, people to pour in on the first day all your, you know, questions. So, that is the exploration stage that is there. How do you... Uh, you know, remove that whole bias or uh, you know, ask the person to really uh, not stop thinking about the solution, but get into the mode of exploration. Yeah, so that's where you do the initial, um, uh, what do we call it? Initial um, goal setting for a sprint where you say this is the problem that we are solving and i think you also uh we somewhere also discussed Rupali, where people tend to go out of the scope of the uh of the of the challenge itself right uh bias is is going to be there always and uh everyone so in reality if if you have a architect or if you have a uh, engineer uh, or if you have a QA person in the team they would always have a way of thinking based on their work area right so if there is an engineer he would always want to make his life easier and come up with the ideas which would which he has already thought about in his head even before you started asking him to write down uh, the fast forwards and all that right um, it is again and again, um, I would say it is it is more like a struggle for us as facilitators to make sure that we keep on reminding people that this particular step is not about coming up with solution. This particular step is all about doing what has been asked for rather than writing down the solutions itself, right? And also to stay within the boundaries, right? I completely understand it is not easy but that is what we thrive for to keep people within the within the guardrails of what we had set um as the as a starting point for the sprint where you create a boundary and you also say that eventually we are talking about the user and this is the problem that needs to solve the user's life rather than our lives uh, so again it is more like educating them every time you meet them <laughs> eventually yeah. people start learning it but to start with, it's 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 always going to be a challenge. Every new person who comes in, uh, it's a challenge. Yeah. So is there a tool that you have uh, used or have experienced that helps this uh, untangle faster? <laughs> no, I don't. Do <laughs> okay. It's okay. a mindset. And again, um, uh, I have personally used. Uh, okay, so it's not a tool, but I have used. Um, so. I can give you two examples. So I did this with two customers um, in the last two years. And both the customers were somewhere educated on why we're doing it and what's the process all about and what are the mindsets. So all the mindsets that we talked about, these were things that we had used as a prior workshop to help them understand what is the way of thinking when we are coming up in a, in a sprint setup. It helped, but still, 
uh, it's a challenge, but it didn't help. So that could be potentially something that you might want to try to explain what are the mindsets and how do we think in a in a in a design sprint or in a design thinking workshop. Um, sometimes it helps. Yes. Okay. But there is no guarantee that whatever you have explained people, they would always keep their, keep it in mind whenever you meet them in a sprint setup. Uh, yeah. They would flow. <laughs> I have a question, Gaurav. Yeah. This is regarding the happiness. Okay, So mm -hmm. I believe that happiness here, you mean to say, when we are uh, measuring the usability. So for example, how many task completion uh, completion or maybe the error rates or time how much time it has taken on the task and also maybe the part of the satisfaction where we say the customer uh, satisfaction score that kind of things we are uh, uh, we are understanding so when Happy we are doing this, yeah please mm -hmm. go. no completely no no completely so, yeah okay so when we are measuring when we are saying that we are measuring the happiness so, so far, uh, we have always seen, I mean, I have always seen the lock, like, uh, like if, so for example, uh, like, uh, as I mentioned, like, uh, how much the task has completed, or from where the users are dropping, or all those stuff that we have seen in login. Is there any other method that, the, or the, any, uh, uh, yeah, it's a method only, is there any method that we can test or measure the happiness apart from log? I will I will talk about the the methods, uh, but happiness is not about task completion or the time it takes. It impacts the happiness, but how? Okay, okay. So happiness would always be about how easy it is to perceive a particular um, uh, module, or how happy people are interacting with this, and would they be coming back to it, right? So somewhere it has uh, the success rates, but it is primarily about the system usability scale, right? And uh, how much people are willing to promote this particular thing and uh, some of the aspects of loyalty and all of that would also come in. But we would talk about it. Uh, there are a few slides on that. What tool do we use under happiness and et cetera? So there are tools much of that. But, Please understand we are talking about the matrix and the happiness or the engagement or the adoption level right how do you measure could vary it is there is no one tool that would be used for measuring happiness or for measuring adoption right or for measuring task success there are multiple tools but hmm. right now the idea was to define a measure define a matrix and say that this is the measure that we would want to capture rather than how we're going to capture okay okay got so and, and this, okay. this is something that again uh i have so a lot of the things that i do has been influenced from what google has done and mm -hmm. heart is also a model that google has defined long back uh mm -hmm. if you search about some of the examples of the matrix that people have created you'd actually see how people have been adding measurements on how they would want to measure a product and the happiness of the user using that particular product. Okay. So there okay. are examples I, out there. Uh, yeah. I think I have covered a few of those somewhere in the slides, but uh, let's, let's go through them. I think it might answer your question as well. Sure, Gaurav, sure. thank you. And second question is, I always believe mm -hmm. the engagement and retention, they are very, it's a, like, it's a part, it's a, maybe the two sides of coin. So why, why did you mention the, the, the fourth point as a retention? Because it's, if it is engagement, then only the possibility that retention. Uh, engagement and retention are separate. I know that what you're talking about is there is an overlap, but one is the measurement of how users interact with your product in a given time frame right and if they're coming back or have they found something better right there is a difference right so engagement would be measuring let's say i want um, x number of people on my product on a daily basis right that's what you'd want to measure in engagement right but are these people coming back 
they might come they might come in and they might be when you say i want 100 users on my uh, or 100 let's say if you're trying to create a arrival a, a of uh, let's say a product like uh, photoshop for example right so you're creating a web based photoshop a very very lightweight version and you're saying that i want some 200 designs to be created by users on my platform that's just engagement but after creating that for the first time or the second time are they coming back that's retention are they continuously doing those 200 designs on a daily basis or is that one of those days where they got the experience to exposure to the product and they spend the time but then they said this is just a waste of time probably it doesn't help i might want to spend whatever hundred dollars 150 dollars on my adobe license and continue to use that Okay. So there's a difference in returning users as well as the engagement level that you'd experience uh, mm -hmm. or want to experience on the product. OK. And in, for this slide, there is a lot. And now I actually got it uh, why you have mentioned the engagement and the retention separately. I got it that one. Mm -hmm. Now that my third one is for the adoption. And then we can move ahead if anyone, uh, no one has the question for this. So for the adoption, I have seen that the like there are many, many times we have seen it's in the adoption. Um, that the the map uh, i would say uh, so as you have mentioned there's a product and the feature so let's example the product okay mm -hmm. so let's example there is a product and it's in the initial level the adoption is uh, adoption rate is low so mm -hmm. the 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 map that scale it goes from the down and then it goes up and then possibly continue going up or maybe the, maybe it's going down so in that scenario initially when the adoption rate is low how the company generally uh, deal with that is that something they feel there is a there is a the ui is not great or the experience is not great how is, is it something the market mark in the market they study something or how generally they deal with that multiple things i mean it could be based on some experience related challenges it could be related to uh, your level of support that you're uh, providing along with the product it could be related to the customer experience it could be related to uh, the the people who who the customers are interacting with while using the product it could be your sales people who are selling the product it could be multiple factors that would that would impact adoption there is no one measure that would help you solve that but essentially all you can do is run those usability metrics or the tests in order to understand the usability problems on the product right it could be ahead of time it could be behind the time there is another product that is giving far more features at a very lower cost no matter how great your uh, your product is no matter how good it looks from an interface perspective or how great it is from an interaction perspective how many channels it is available at but if it is behind the curve then it is behind the curve it is not going to succeed that's not something that you can solve right so yeah adoption itself is a very very vast thing um what we are only focused upon is are there any usability issues that is impacting adoption but the testing is might proving if there is no usability a usability challenge or maybe our ui ui ux is great and it's an early thing so early. in that scenario and now no 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 no, 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 no 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 it's not early it's not early please understand all the things that i'm talking about here is not a early thing you remember i also talked about something called as how do you continuously look at your product and make sure it is up to the mark, whatever you've designed, let's say six months back or two years back, it is still part of the product, but is it something that is still, that is still able to compete with the market? Is, can that be improved? Is it the best that we could offer as a product feature? All of those things are things that run are run periodically rather than doing at once, right? So it is not something that you do while designing the product and you said that my success rate for my usability test is amazing. People didn't find any usability issue. It is perfect. I did one more round when the product was launched on the product, not really the prototype. And everyone who was involved in that usability test was really happy. But slowly six months down the line or one year down the line the there was a dip uh in the adoption rate it could be because of the feature that is outdated you haven't improved upon it which means that you have to continuously run every three or six months you have to run these tests that you're 
originally defined with the newer set of users who are seeing it for the first time or the people who have also been using it and they have also experienced other products out there in the market that give a better usability so where exactly are you lacking it's not a one-time effort that is where iteration continuously happens on the same feature on the same product right right got you any example is uh, popping in your mind uh, just we uh, just give me the one one single uh, example any brand or anything which is they are actually the very early they struggle and then they uh, did the very good things because if i if i consider the ola and uber so they came the ux was ex externally extremely good and they just boom i like i don't see they have seen the early adoption or something like that yeah but but if you if you read some of their case studies uh, karna you would see why they have struggled in countries like india or china because of the politics because of the union bazi because of lots of other factors as well it is not just about the experience of the application that you hold in your hand and that's where there were lots of external factors that impacted their uh, their downfall to a certain extent they're still not down by the way they're doing good in various areas in the world uh, but there is a downward trend that you're referring to right which is beyond the experience of the application it is it is something that you cannot really control with the app design but it is lots of other factors yeah sure sure thank you so much all right so there are some examples that we talked about so uh, in terms of sketching uh, we said four step process right so four step process is notes ideas crazy eights and solution sketch so essentially how do you write a note and there is a time that i've mentioned here if you if you also focus on that right so essentially notes is where you capture all the key information that you've either written down as the fast forward when you started with or during the uh, during the lightning uh, talks from the experts or the product sponsor or these were things that you had verified or you questioned them during those um, uh, during the conversations uh, after you've written the note right where you somewhere tried to validate your uh, thoughts right into um, uh, into what people think about it right from an expert perspective that's where you talk to the um, talk to these uh, smes uh, which was on day one with that you write some notes and those notes really translate into some ideas and these are very very rough ideas but there could be like one idea which you'd want to expand and uh, really define and um, somewhere uh, create variations for and that's where crazy it comes in where you are trying to create the same idea into four different variations, right? As designers, it will be easy for us. I have seen, honestly, it with my experience, people who are new to sketching or new to uh, designing, they somewhere struggle and they might not come up with eight ideas. Some come with two, some come with three, but that's okay. The idea is to actually create variations as many variations as possible here eight and eight is like a very very good number <laughs> to achieve uh, even designers struggle at times i have struggled at times to create eight variations of the same idea but essentially you pick one idea from step two and expand it into three dif uh, eight different ideas in step three uh, or eight different variations of the same idea in step three and then eventually that becomes a solution sketch, which essentially is a sequence of sketches with some descriptors mentioned on the right hand side. I don't know if it is, I don't think it is visible here, but essentially there is uh there is a explanation of what we are trying to do here. And based on that, there is there is a sketch on the left. So when you do the artboarding, essentially people read through the explanation and also we look at the sketches on the left and try and vote for them uh, or cross question during the uh, during the critics activities uh, that's where the sketch comes in handy because you're not really asking people to say uh, to sketch right but you're actually giving them a process that you write down what is in your head uh, based on what you have heard so far from others you use them in the 
ideas as what are the different ones that you'd want to create as rough noodles and essentially use the best ones or whatever you want to translate into the crazy aids, which eventually would be translated into a sketch. So sometimes what you had created in step two is the one that goes into step four directly because you've probably designed the first idea that you had doodled was the best one and you actually landed on step four with the same thing. Sometimes it gets refined into crazy aids and that's where you are able to look at multiple aspects of that same idea and create variations of that into the step three and that really solidifies what you've created in step four, which is the solution sketch. Uh, then there are other things which we talked about. I have to skip this. All right. So we talked about this one. Um, and this is really, really important where how are we, how exactly are we deciding what idea is the best idea? Everyone uh, would come up with their ideas and they would feel that my idea is the best one here. But essentially, we look at it in an effort versus impact scale at the time of voting and after the voting if there are ties. Right? Uh, so we look at all these different ideas and we say the ones that are high impact and low effort are the ones that are winners and something that we need to pursue with right away. The ones that are high impact, high effort are probably more creation of products or projects, which would eventually be a long-term thing. But what we are trying to solve here as a scope of what we had designed, defined as the design challenge, we look at the low effort, high impact solutions, and that's what we're going to use. I mentioned something called a storyboard. This is an example, again, with the steps and clearly defined um, details on what these steps are, which essentially is a storyboard. I did say that there are when we when we talk to instructional designers, when we talk to people in education, they want to create more like a um, comic strip or things which look visual in terms of storyboards. But we're not talking about them right now because it is not really a point of designing those, but essentially defining clear steps in terms of where the user would start and where he would end with the problem, uh, with the solution that we had designed. Um, uh, let's see, what else do we have? We talked about this. Prototyping is fine. Usability test. Uh, okay, so these are some of the examples. So these are some real examples, right? Uh, some of those Miro boards and this one, I think, was done on a Google slide where people added, we captured the ideas from different people. We voted them. We did definitely mapping after we voted uh, the and we got the winners. We categorized them. Uh, we defined a success criteria. We also did the map and then the area that we wanted to work upon, right? So the map would actually talk about a larger, bigger picture. But we focused on this selected area here, which was the heat map that I talked about, right? That eventually got translated into sketches. These are the votes that you see. And uh, the best ones actually got created into some of those uh, storyboards as steps. Um, so that was more like a, a example of what I talked about. Uh, we can skip some of those things. OK, so usability thing, right? So let me switch the slides, and then I'm going to talk about what are the usability things that I'm talking about. All right, so now this is a little bit, um, how should I say it? This is a, a little complex topic to understand, but I'll try my best to explain it in uh, whatever time we have. So we talked about heart model. And heart, like I said, stands for happiness, engagement, adoption, retention, and task success. Um, traditionally, this has been, um, I mean, the, the traditional ways of measuring a, a product was focused normally on gathering the data as much as possible from a quantity perspective. But we are also talking a little bit around uh, the qualitative aspects as well. Happiness essentially is more like an uh, more like what we would want to capture in terms of attitudes and um, and service that we'd want to run on the product. Now, 
some of the things that would come under happiness would be satisfaction, uh, perceived ease of use, and NPS. There are more, but we don't. We are only looking at these three for now. Right? Engagement. Uh, engagement in itself has number of visits per user in a day, week, month. Like I said, within a time frame. Uh, how many people were active on the platform or what was the concurrency? That is what you measured here. And then number of completed actions uh, that you would want to see as the completion rate of some of those tasks that you had defined as part of your uh, solution. That is also something that we capture under engagement. Adoption, again, like I said, it's how many new people are coming onto the product, but usage of the new feature that you had defined that you had created what is the measurement of that um any new subscription registrations created using the feature that you had or because of the feature that you had created and new purchases as well right? lots of factors that uh, impact adoption but again it's more of a b2c thing where you are actually designing directly for the consumers and they are the ones who are paying for your service that's where adoption is primarily used. I haven't used it, at least uh, in the products that we are talking about. Retention, as the name suggests, is straightforward. Now let's look at some of the <clears throat> tools. And tax access, is, I think, is also very straightforward. I don't think we need to spend that more time on that. So while defining the uh, the matrix, uh, each of these uh, categories are defined into goals, signals, and metrics. So the goals would be things that you'd want to measure at a high level. Signals are the ones that you'd want that you would be able to capture. Things that would be the triggers, and metrics would be more like uh, something that would that could be measured, right? That's where a numerical value of sorts would come in as the matrix, right? Um, or the things that you'd want to use as tools in order to measure that, right? And this could be further detailed down. So user. So this is just one example. You should users should feel the application is unique and help them with the content development process. Satisfaction rating from survey is the signal that we're going to use. And then the matrix that would be used is NPS. So what's the score? Perceived users use, what's the score? And the satisfaction index, what's the score? Right. These probably would are things that you'd run periodically over the period of time and see if there is a dip or if it is going up. And with this matrix, you also define that I want X as my solution uh, satisfaction index. I want Y as my NPS score. And I want Z as my perceived ease of use. Right? That's where a numerical value helps you with measuring where do you stand in the whole game. Um, all right. So again, uh, these are somewhere uh, captured with ISO standards and all that. We can skip some of those pieces. Now let's directly get into um, effectiveness. So yeah, effectiveness. Got one second, please. Sorry. One second. Yeah. So you are talking about the survey. I don't know personally. I don't prefer the survey because this is the questions always say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Uh, there is no open-ended question, and then it might be possible that people are may not be putting their heart, and they are just saying ticking on that particular radio button instead of just giving the thought like what is the question is asked for. So in that scenario, yeah. how the survey will be reliable? Yeah, so when I say survey, it is not a survey survey. It is something that you use along with the product. So I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, sure. When we get to surveys and how do we write surveys, we'll, we'll talk about that today, as well as when exactly these surveys are used. So these are used within the, uh, within the environment when you're trying to do a usability test. This is not something that is sent out as an email that you click on this, use a Google form, and uh, fill out this survey. Right? Not like that. Within this is just in time when somebody is using your product, you give them uh, the questions and they answer it based on that specific thing. So there are task-based surveys, and then there are or questionnaires, and then there are uh, the whole test-based questionnaires as well, which is what you use as your quantitative uh, measure. To come out with a usability test. So we'll talk about that. Uh, wait a minute. Sure. Thank you. All right. So effectiveness is more about completion rate. Um, primarily, it's a, it's a binary thing whether users were able to complete it, complete the task, or not complete the task without any help. So whenever we are designing uh, a new feature, let's say you have to uh, upload a file, right? And uh, what type of file, how many files at once, 
where to click, uh, what are the different methods to upload it, can you upload it from Google Drive, can you upload it from your machine, can you upload it from um, uh, SharePoint, right? All of these things are not that you, not really something that you help uh, at the time of test. Essentially, users would have to figure out on their own. And if they're able to complete their task successfully, you measure it against one and zero, right? Uh, and that's where you define a task. And then based on that task, whether the users were able to complete or not gives you a number. And out of the, all the people that used that uh, particular test, you come up with a number and which gives you a percentage of how much was the completion, how much percentage was the completion rate. Satisfaction itself is broken into multiple different tools, right? The first one is ASQ, which is after scenario questionnaire. Essentially, you ask three questions and you use a Leckert scale of seven points with strongly agree and strongly disagree. Uh, something, uh, okay. So please keep that in mind. These are some of the methods that have been used. Oh, one second. Just give me one second. I'll go ahead to go on mute. All right, sorry about that. So, <clears throat> okay. So I was saying that some of these methods that are mentioned here, like ASQ and SUS and, and so on and so forth, these are the ones that are scientifically created and used with specific type of questions and scales. So these are tried and tested out methods. How do we use it and where do we use it is something that defines whether they would work or not, right? So ASQ, ASQ, like I said, is an after scenario questionnaire where you put a scenario in front of the users, you ask them to complete something or do a task. Again, this is a task level satisfaction, like I said. So based on the task itself, they give you a scale. This is what I mentioned as a survey. So as and when you're completing a task, you're actually understanding from the user what the, how they felt. Uh, are they overall satisfied with the task and how they completed it? Are they overall satisfied with the amount of time that it took for them to complete the scenario? And overall, uh, are they satisfied with the support information or the clues, visual clues, or the directions, helps messages, onboarding, um, all of those pieces, right? That are really things that you do from a UX perspective. How did they feel about it is what they add just in time while they are doing the test. Right. So that is ASQ. The next one is SEQ, which is single ease question. Again, a simplified version of ASQ, but essentially things that would. So you would probably ask a single question after the uh, after a scenario has completed. Essentially, it is administered immediately after the attempt has been completed. Whether it was fail or pass, we don't really matter. But you ask that question, and how do they perceive that particular? task. Please understand, in a usability test for one feature, you might come up with 20 different tasks, and these are run 20 times after the task is completed. That's why a usability test takes time. All right. So these are more like task level satisfaction indexes. Well, got one question, please. Mm -hmm. So it's in it's in the on the on the top. Uh, there is a one to seven, right? Strongly agree, strongly disagree. Yeah. Why there are the seven? When if I'm keeping the five, which I've seen many times, so three is the mm -hmm. midpoint of it, and strongly agree one to one and two, like the extreme uh, extreme agree first, uh, and after the third, there are the four and fifth. So this this is the better measurement than the seven. So why there are the seven? Why yeah, it could be a three point scale? It could be five star rating. It could be anything that you can think about. But like it I said, make any difference. yeah, yeah. This comes from scientifically proven methods. I am not defining it. That's where I have used exactly how it was defined by psychologists because there's psychology behind it as well. That is where a seven point scale is used. Okay. Okay. We might think that five point star rating would work best, or if I have a 10 point scale, it would also work best. Or I might use just three things one is fail, two is average, three is pass. Right? Mm. People have done that. 
but this particular method and the calculation that you use on top of it has been derived from this so it is not really giving you 1357 it is actually using allowing you to add a formula on top of it to come up with a number and that is what is measured only by a seven point scale okay got you thank you all right um okay so the next one is test level satisfaction which is sus i am more interested in this uh, always because this is a quick and dirty way a uh, dirty way and probably the most reliable tool that, that you can use for usability testing which consists of 10 questions and again you would see the difference here the number of questions increase but the scale is decreasing and you would only have five options here right uh, <coughs> all right so agreement and disagreement but the questions are i think i would like to use the system frequently i would i found the system unnecessarily complex and there are trick questions here please understand there would be certain things which would be on the disagreement side there would be some questions which would be on the agreement side uh and the way they are written so the idea is not to modify the questions not to change the scale but to use them as is no matter what we are addressing right so things like the for the variation functions of the system are integrated are they loosely coupled what what's your idea about it right again these are things that you don't have to always use on a software setup you can also use it when you're designing a remote control for example right uh these are things uh these tests or these uh, tools can be applied anywhere right so that's your sus but the calculation is a little complex here so you would see the calculation here for each odd number response so there is a even number and odd number here right for each odd number uh questions we subtract one from the score that was received for each even numbered question we would subtract their value from five so again like i said there are trick questions here they are mentioned in certain order we are only supposed to keep that order and that scale every time so with that formula that you've applied for each user now the uh, the the values would be available for you as the total and then you multiply it by 2.5 and the number that you get could be used on this scale here so i'll quickly maybe open this one and let's see if you're able to see what i'm showing all right do you see the excel sheet now yes yes okay so we are not really concerned about what the question was here we are only capturing the results because the questions and the and the values of the scale never change so either it is one two three or four based on that we use the participant and we use the number and that's what the number comes in here right so you would see that there are these differences and these calculations with every odd and even number what does what happens here and not all of that and with that you get a total number so you would see that something was uh, uh, subtracted by one, something was subtracted from five, so on and so forth, based on the questions. And then you came up with this number, which is divided and you did a 2.5 times. So with each participant, you get a sus score, which is mentioned here. But if your sus score is 65, what does that mean? uh that means i'll go back to my document the 65 means that you are marginal and you are somewhere sitting in between uh the high marginal thing so it is neither not acceptable nor acceptable but somewhere sitting in between which would give you a great scale and this time it would be a d and the score would be 65. now how do we use it we come up with a grade scale and say that this is a b c d e or f Right? there is no e a b c d and f and the number which is the um, rating and with that every time you run the test periodically you're able to see if you are either growing or you're going down uh, with the same result and that's where uh, this comes in handy because you're talking about the full test not really one small task that was there on the uh, on the uh, on the test itself nps we must have we must all of must have seen it uh, a very good example is uh, uh, i think uh, what's that called shopper stop every time you make a payment or you buy something on their counter they have this scale uh, added uh, right there 
uh, as soon as you make a payment, the person standing behind the counter is going to tell you, please use the scale, please rate us, and they capture it every time a purchase is made. A very good implementation of this. But what we're interested in here is how do we break down those the scores, right? So one, zero to six, and if people are really promoting our, uh, our service or this product or this organization, uh, zero to six is something that are these retractors and they're not going to be promoting us at all. Seven and eight are the passives and essentially they may or may not, right? But the ones that we're really interested in is nine and 10, which are the promoters. So that is the way of looking at seven through 10, uh, the people who have done seven through 10 people and focus on them specifically to solve some of the problems that they had come up with during the uh, the test level satisfaction as well as task level satisfaction indexes. So based on their responses, uh, there are also open-ended things which we do on a on an unmoderated test, right? which are then used to make sure that we convert the passives into promoters and distract detractors into uh, passives. There is a very, very less chance of converting the ones who have rated from zero to six into seven and eight, but you there is a big chance that you can convert the ones who have rated seven and eight into nine and 10 and make them promoters. And that's where you focus on. This is your focus area. So the Ambers are the ones that are usually used to turn them into green. And all the feedback that the people in the green gave is the ones that you continuously keep and you never change those. Right. So that's more like your NPS. And then there is this uh, calculation for each of these things. Like now, now comes the math, right? So with everything that you do as a qualitative, sorry, quantitative thing, there is a math behind it. So Effectiveness, there is number of tasks successfully completed and total number of tasks undertaken by 100. That gives you a percentage. Efficiency is also uh, calculated based on the tasks that were completed per second or per minute. And that's what gave you the time-based efficiency. And then there is a big formula that you apply based on the total number of tasks, the number of users who came about taking the test, number of people who were able to complete it, people who are not able to complete it, and all of that, that gives you a time-based efficiency scale. Um, and we talked about some of those already, right? So that's more like what you would uh, use. Depends on the type of the project and how you're using it. But how does it look like is an example that I will show you. So this was one of the tests that was performed long back for one of our customers. And like I said, you come up with the task and there are these four tasks and clear directions given on how to use them. Again, these are things that were done on a clickable prototype, uh, not really um, something that was already built out. But with those tasks, we used a tool called User Zoom. I think uh, some of us have looked at it in the past. But User Zoom was used to add all of these tasks and the questionnaires that you saw as the test level and the task level tests, as well as the uh, NPS at the end. And with each of these tasks, you were able to capture some numbers and that helped us with some of these things that you see here as legends and what they gave as feedback. So the score was calculated like I showed you previously as the effectiveness, efficiency from each task was defined as the, uh, as the goals that were met every minute, uh, the satisfaction index, which I talked about as SUS, this was around 63, which was marginally or OK uh, as a grade C. And then the task level satisfaction was also captured. right? So that was more like a dashboard that got created after we were able, we were, uh, we had run the whole unmoderated usability test. And then, of course, with the NPS score, we got a number. And the score was minus 33, which really told us that we need, we are somewhere here where we need to um, uh, improve upon, right? And then there were these open-ended things, which I talked about as things that people kept on talking because we were recording their video as well as their screen while they were taking the test. And with that, we were able to capture these qualitative feedback as well and how people reacted to each of these things, where they were struggling to find an action, where they struggled to 
uh, to complete an action where they were not able to find the call to action button, blah, 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 all of those things, right? So all of those things got uh, captured. And based on that, we came up with certain suggestions. And those are the ones that we used here. And this was then used as the next phase to modify uh, our test into another design sprint. And we completed that with a better score. I don't have the file uh, handy with me, but we were able to compare the results from this one to that one with the improvements that were done on the uh, between these two tests. All right. Again, a very big area, like I said, very, very complex, but uh, very useful to talk about numbers and debate easily and defend your designs and the solutions you've created. Any questions on this, on this before I quickly switch to the next thing? No, I do not have. All right. Okay, so we talked about um, the lightning decision jams. And uh, I said, this is more of a workshop that we use normally not like a sprint, but to define and get a direction and see where the where the people's interests are within a team, right? Essentially, it's a very, very fast paced thing, which uses some of the techniques that we saw in the uh, design thinking techniques and essentially use those. Again, define a goal for the workshop. That's something that is defined along with the team. We come up with a, with a goal and then go back to the team and use the five minutes to modify it if at all needed. Right? So that becomes our challenge. Um, so that's step zero. Step one is, again, more like a fast forward where we see and capture what will make us successful. Uh, there is a very famous sailboat activity that we use for LDJ. But essentially, noting down all that the people think in terms of what are the things and how, what are the things that are going to benefit out of what we have painted as a picture in the vision or the design challenge, how they're going to help, what's the value add of that. Step two is to capture what people feel as what will stop us from achieving this goal. So what would hold us back is what we capture here at the bottom under the boat, which is going to pull the boat under the water, right? These are the things that we need to focus upon and solve, essentially, right? Um, step three is to look at prioritizing these problems. So there are these issues or things that would stop us in achieving those, right? There are things which would be beyond your control. Oh my God, I'm not sharing anything. No, I was just going to know. Oh, even I also felt my... like why you're... All right, I'll start again. Sorry. OK, so I said define the goal. We write it down before the workshop, but we validate it with the team so that all of us are on the same page. This is the goal setting. Uh, we go for step one. Uh, we capture what would make us successful with this particular challenge that we're trying to solve or with the problem or the challenge that we have at hand, what, what are the benefits or the value that it is going to generate? And what are the things that would stop us as step two from achieving this particular goal? And those are the things that would pull the boat down under the water. These are the things that we'd focus on, but there are only a few things that would be in your control in this particular design challenge, right? Or in this workshop challenge, basically. So, there would only be a few things. For example, recession is not in your control, so you're not going to talk about it. But the ones that are in your control, we ask the participants to vote them and say, what are the high priority things that we'd want to focus upon, right? This is where people come together and help you give a direction. Because if there is a big stakeholder, a uh, uh, lot of stakeholders, essentially, that you are dealing with, uh, for example, some of the projects that I deal with, they they go in all sorts of directions. So this really helps everyone to come together and focus on and prioritize on what we're going to work upon next, right? Uh, and get, get some sort of direction because people are talking about 10,000 things. Right? Some say we should use a third party tool. We should buy uh, a Microsoft license. Some say we're going to build this particular thing. Uh, what would 
where exactly people want to do as as a collective goal is not something that is clear that's where these things come in handy so with the ones that are voted higher uh, right where the prior problems are prioritized we then use how might we we've all discussed that in a lot of detail now we write it down and say these are the how might we statement that we'd want to solve right with that your next step is to create solutions on saw on some of these how might we's so with each of these you add an idea at the bottom this is the idea that is going to help us achieve this how might we right again there is another voting which helps us to prioritize which ideas are the ones that we want to take upon we are not really designing anything here but we are only asking people to vote and get a sense of where what people's feelings are generally in a general sense and where they want to be right uh, with the prioritized solutions we take out some action items and that is where we create certain goals for the team and say these are the things that we'd want to pursue from here because the team has defined the things that would make us successful they have defined what would stop us in achieving our goals we've also asked them to prioritize based on their priorities we came up with these ideas which they voted collectively and said these are the ones that we should pursue now the ones that are are highly voted here are the ones that would result into action items and action items could be run a design sprint talk to the same stakeholder do a market research run a usability test or various other things right, depending on the nature of the workshop and with that you have clear goals which could be done in like two hours i've done it in one and a half as well depending on the size but with within those two hours you'd be able to get a direction get everyone on the same page and move as a team with some clear action items which you can track rather than going around in circles so this is one of those tools which really helps us fast track things and uh, result could be varying depending on the type of the team but essentially you have some clear outputs that you can use because everyone has been talking about the same thing in these meetings all right so this was another tool that is part of collaboration and decision making uh, and uses some aspects of design thinking as well like you see okay. all right any questions on this all right if that is all i think we have arrived at the end of our uh seek series of uh, meetings that we wanted to have and uh, essentially this is what we wanted to achieve as a team uh, if we work together using some of the tools and techniques and mindsets that we talked about we can focus on correct problems we can have team alignment with the uh, testing techniques and keeping everyone on the same page we'd be able to get 360 degree validation we can easily define measurements uh, measures for success and the criteria because it is fast paced and you always come out with a tangible output it saves time and money and you get some real feedback in the end because that's that's what you expect right with some of these tools and techniques um all right so that ends our um five day design thinking human centered design workshop uh i'm sure the learning department would reach out to you to give feedback i hope it was helpful uh thank you all so much for spending your mornings with me i wanted to express my gratitude towards you from last five uh i mean last five days you have spent with us 450 minutes and you're constantly talking and you are giving that knowledge uh to me i think and i and the best thing is like you allow us to interrupt any time any moment for those question so for me at least it is very difficult to carry the question and then keep learning so it was really helpful for me thank you very much Goro. Uh, good that it helped you 
Yeah, I would second that. Uh, uh, definitely, this has been uh, very interesting, and uh, especially the pace that you had, Gaurav, you did not really pace through uh, and skip uh, some of these key uh, things. Uh, so I think which is really great. Thank you for these sessions. I hope uh, you guys use some of these tools from now on. Um, I, uh, Rupali, I'm, I'm still supposed to share something. Uh, while I joined this call, I remember that you asked me to share some of those files, which I haven't yet, but I think it, I'll make it public and everyone should be able to access them later on. Yeah. And one last question, right, <laughs> while you end this. Um, now, this is a philosophy or methodology, if you talk about design uh, thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Now, and then there are all of these tools that we spoke about, this whole um, concept of uh, design sprint and all of that right and what i also see is even if you if we don't so we might not have a big gray problem to really run a complete design sprint but then you know for any problem that you have and it is even a smaller problem and that you would want to solve it you can just pick up some of these tools put them in a sequence that it is expected to uh, with this whole methodology that is there and still it should uh, work right with your experience I think about absolutely. it now. absolutely the problem could be big or small the problem could be things that um, you have no idea what you're trying to solve um, or it could be easy and you already know what you want to achieve but at the pace at which you move forward that is really helpful um, and uh, I think you remember but uh, the first design that we made for our uh, product and we called it um, LOR. LOR that was done using a sprint internally and yes. uh, whatever ideas we came up with they still hold true uh, we've added a lot on top but the base idea was something that we came up with in those four days which is which is what this helps with true All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I need to jump on to another call. I'm already late. But thank you so much for your time. And uh, please reach out if you have any further questions. I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, thanks Absolutely. a lot, Laura. Thanks, thanks, thanks Laura. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.